Right. Hi, guys. So the reason I was asked in, um, apart from probably being local, is that I direct an animated series called Rubbish World of Dose Bud, which is on CIT at the moment. It's kind of not your age range. It's sort of six to 12 year olds. Um, it's doing really well for us. Um, last year, we won the Royal Television Award for Best Children's Series. And I think what I'd say is what stands out about the show, it's very British. So we've got all American imports on animation, obviously. And what I'm proud of with this show, it's, it has a very British feeling about it, very British voices, we have accents in it. We use a very British cast and crew. Um, and so it's been seen as Marmite by everybody trying to sell it internationally. They're like going, well, it's too British. And I was like, well, when you get shows from America, they're not too American. But anyway, at the end of the day, it's, it's doing well for us in, in the UK. Um, we've got versions that have been translated into Gaelic and in Welsh. And we um, have got random pickup in places like Australia, the Basque country, Sweden. Uh, so quite niche places, but um, that's the show. So I'll talk about how I went from studying in Wrexham to getting a TV series commission. So this is my show, I created it. I write it based on my designs and um, I now direct it. So it's sort of across the board. And so if you're interested in storytelling or animation itself or how to get a TV series commissioned, um, I'll hopefully go through that or how story structure works for a multiple episode thing. Anything that maybe you have to avoid, I think you want, and then just ask any questions at the end. I think it's, it's interesting to you because I know you're all from different departments and it's not always your, your thing. And I'll try and make sure that I don't waffle because I do waffle. <laughs> Sorry. So this is, a, I'll give you a clip of the show. I'll give you a little trailer so you get an idea what the show's about. So that's what I'm doing now, um, but how I got there. So I started up the road at the art college um, in Wrexham many years ago. And um, what I was doing there was kind of illustration and a bit of everything. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I was doing print, I was doing illustration, graphic design. And um, while I was there, I was illustrating um, and I made this chicken book with like <laughs> a metal cover and stuff. I was um, heavily into Madonna at the time. She brought out a sex book, which was metal. And I was like, right, I'm going to do a kid's book that's got a metal cover. So I made that in the garage. Um, and it, it, it was kind of a story that I made up about a man who works at a chicken factory. He's not very nice. And then the chickens take revenge. And it was a pop-up book. Um, and you can see it's totally impractical for actually printing or anything like that. But it kind of taught me that I liked storytelling and quite um, dark humour and that kind of Raul Dahl, um, Quinton Blake, illustration style, um, Ralph Steadman type stuff. So I sort of set my kind of early days of what my style might be. And I say this was interactive. So I was already aware that my, my drawing ability wasn't the best. I was never going to be like a great painter or do great portraiture. But if I could make my work interactive, add like kind of interactive element to it, it kind of boosted it. So immediately I was getting into pop up, but that would then lead me into getting into animation more. So I went from Wrexham to Hull. Um, it wasn't my choice to go to Hull. Um, I applied to like everywhere else, like Nottingham and places like that. But I totally uh, fluffed up my interviews and um, I put down Hull as like a reserve. So I didn't even visit there, but I got that's where I got in. And um, it turns out it was the best place for me. I really enjoyed it there. Um, and while I was there, I was able to try animation for the first time. And although 
the tutors weren't around very much. They left you alone with some really old equipment which you could just play on, and I really liked that. Um, so I made a short film based on kind of stuff that I knew. So, um, so that's a photo of me when I was really little with my grandma and my mum. And my gran always um, had a really strong impression on me. I didn't know her very long, but I knew she was really stoic and a strong character and um, quite frightening and grumpy. So I thought that would be quite a good lead character, kind of an anti-hero character. I was definitely at a university where most of the students doing animation lived and breathed animation. They loved Disney, they loved Disney princesses, they loved all the, the, the hero comics and things like that. And I was determined that I was going to do the opposite of that. So I was going to think I was grumpy and miserable and um, dark humoured and nothing would work out well at the end. And I was going to make sure there's no happy endings. <laughs> so I enjoyed uh, telling sort of dark stories about this old lady who was really strong, but then putting in really terrible situations that she had to deal with. And because she was a strong character, she, she dealt with it fine. Um, because I didn't have much equipment, I used acetate sheets that I found from a printer machine and used acrylics uh, to paint the cells and worked out how you sort of do frame by frame animation. Um, at that time, I hadn't learned that you can, in between, you sort of do your keyframes and you're in between. That, I didn't know that, I was just learning by myself. So I was learning that by just drawing things forwards, um, how I got it. And because it was all set in the Antarctic, because I dumped this old lady in the Antarctic. Um, I needed lots of snow, but I'm also very lazy, so I didn't want to draw lots of snowdrops falling. So I just worked out if you flick paint onto the frame and do repeat it every three frames, just keep repeating, repeating it, you, you kind of create a blizzard effect. And um, I decided that was great, so I went with that. So I'll show you a little clip of that. So this is my first um, proper animation. Knew this has happened. Let's try again. It's because yeah, the files are quite big. I'll play it from that type of screen, see if that helps. Okay. Anyway, that's enough of that. So basically you get the idea that um, <laughs> they, they didn't have colour, they, they, they had an old Rostrum camera at the, at the university, a really old one, and it worked with film. And uh, colour film was really expensive, so I worked with black and white film, so that's why it's black and white. Um, but I also, as I say, quite a lazy animator, I worked out, rather than trying to draw something beautifully, if you just get a really good strong look on your character, like a really good eye stare and good contact with the audience, you can just cycle those frames and you'll get a much more character across than you would if you're trying to do really beautiful animation walking around and all that business. You can sort of do a quick shorthand of getting across a, a person's sort of inner character. So I've been working on that. Um, the voiceover was done by a journalist who lived in Manchester who was just a friend, but I just really liked his voice and all the music was stolen from records I got from charity shops, so it can never really go to festivals. <laughs> so, um, but what it did do, um, it did win me a Student Royal Television Award um, for that film. It, it got sent um, to compete with the other sort of postgraduate courses, and it won. And, it, and I think the reason why it won is because 
I don't know, it, it's got a strong story arc and um, maybe it felt a bit different. But it, because it won, it got me a bit noticed in big old London and uh, I got my first kind of job. Um, right, I'm going to go back to presentation mode if I can. That. So yeah, um, so I got to meet Richard Whiteley, who was a TV presenter at the time, and um, I got a job working on adverts and short films in uh, Great Marble Street in London for quite a famous director actually called Oscar Grillo, who did really flamboyant animations. He was a really big character, and uh, he hired me because he liked my student film and he really liked my chicken book, that metal chicken book. It was in my portfolio, and I think he was getting a lot of applicants from uh, students and young professionals from America who have like the Disney portfolio with um, turnarounds and all the kind of traditional animation. And so when I came in with like a metal chicken book that was quite textural and a black and white film with lots of grain all over it, it stood out. But for him, that was in a good way, where quite a lot of his studios, to be honest, also said, no, you can't animate. You haven't been taught how to animate. You've been allowed to do your own thing. We could never employ you. But for this one guy, he, that's the reason why he did employ me. And so I got a, an income and I worked on these adverts for like Smith's Crisps and um, Peas and uh, we did some videos for Linda McCartney <laughs> through via Paul McCartney at the time. Um, so it was good, but I also got frustrated because I learned that it was actually quite hard animating again because you had to draw it beautifully and do thick and thin lines and make sure that um, you did what the animators want you to, to do because I was the assistant and I I struggled actually having my work kept, kept being sent back to me saying it wasn't good enough. And my reaction to that was, well, the story's not very good in the first place, but you want me to work really hard to make this look beautiful. But that's what their, their role seemed to be. Just make, don't question it, just make it look as good as possible. And so um, all my friends at the time kind of realized that I was going home, sometimes in tears, because I really found it hard to do the work. I found it so stressful that I couldn't do what they wanted me to do. I found it almost, I couldn't control the line properly and I couldn't do the <coughs> thick and thin. I just technically wasn't as strong as the animators. And um, I thought, oh my God, I've chosen this career path and I've done all this education and I don't know if I can do it. So I found it really hard and the animators were pulling their hair out every time I assisted them. And sometimes they'd ask somebody else to do it because they realized that I wasn't very good. But the boss just kept me there in my chair because he really liked my work. Um, but, I, I was told by a friend, or well, maybe you should go back and re-educate more and make another film that shows off your style again, but at a higher level, so you get hired as the director, not as the animator, but as the director. Um, and so that's what I did. So I found it quite tricky, actually, to give up a wage and go back to being a student again. It felt like a step back, but actually it was a big step forward, but you don't always think that way at the time. So I went to the NFTS, um, National Film Television School in Beaconsfield. I did apply to the Royal College of Art because it was on TV and it was more famous, but I didn't get in. Um, so I went to the NFTS, which I'd never heard of, but it was, once again, fate. It was the right place to be. I really, it was the right course for me. And uh, what it is, is a, it's a school that's built on an old film lot. So it's got big sound stages and um, cinematography departments and editing departments and documentary. So you've not just got animators, you've got all these different departments working in the same space so you learn from them and you can talk with them about films and editing and watch films and it was a really good experience. I decided to revisit Pension the Penny, my first film, and see if I could expand it for a series because I wanted to be the director of the series so I thought if it's currently about an old lady on her own that's not going to have much mileage for stories and also that I quite I'd learned by this point, that usually the, the viewer is looking at the, the person on screen who's of a similar age. Like if you're watching a kid's show, you're probably watching a kid as the, the lead character. And if you're in your 30s, you're kind of watching and interacting with people in their 20s and 30s. So I realized this old pensioner lady was going to be a problem, but I wanted to keep her. So I put her personality into a little girl. <laughs> so I, I like, 
And so I decided that Gran was this little girl and she would just create a gr little grumpy little girl. So I started doing doodles for that. And basically that's my drawing style. What is a grumpy girl? It's just a really big frowned face and two eyes again, because I didn't want them to be level, I sort of hiding behind my drawings, making them think a bit weird. Um, and what I'm going to do with this little girl, give her a family, take, him on, take her on a, a really terrible adventure, a road trip through Wales, um, going to Holyhead to catch the ferry to Ireland. And that was the kind of the concept. And so Anna Spud was born as a, a student film. And there's Gran still in it, but now in colour. Because again, I couldn't really see myself pitching a black and white children's series. <laughs> so I thought it has to be colour. I've got to make it <coughs> easy as I can. So there might be a clip here, if it'll play. tried hard to imagine a world that was full of wonderful, marvellous, happy things. Um, I'm not a happy little girl. Poor Anna. Even her dreams are rubbish. Will anyone else ever see the world like Anna? Full of disappointment, misery and family nightmares. So, um, so as you can see, I, you, you kind of discover that if you write a script and people like it, people will work with you for very little. Um, so I managed to massively up my cast um, profile. So I managed to get voices for that, like Terry Wogan, Jim Broadbent, Pam Ferris, Liz Smith, Moena Banks. Um, so a really good cast at that time um, for a student film. And I did it on purpose because I wanted my student film to really get noticed and show that I could work with so-called industry professionals and that I could handle it. So it's sort of given an example that as a director, I wasn't going to totally mess it up. Um, and the, the visual obviously improved because I got access at the university to some computer software and things like that, which I learned. So it became more colorful and more 3D and that kind of stuff. Um, the film did okay, it went around festivals, um, picked up some awards, but nothing major. But it did um, get the interest of some studios in London for series work. So they liked it. They could see it was a family-based drama. They could see there's a story arc in it. They could see the main character was this little girl. And they felt <coughs> it had warmth to it. Uh, they, they kept saying it has warmth. So uh, I got interest from Working Title, who were doing films like Notting Hill at the time. and. Um, and a studio called Illuminated Films who were doing uh, series work and they'd done a series called Spider. They'd, they'd worked on uh, The Snowman and When the Wind Blows, but they, were, they, were gonna, they just commissioned to get this children's book, uh, Little Princess, this preschool series, and they were looking for a director for that. Um, so when they kept asking about Anna Spud, I wasn't, they kept asking what I'm going to do with it next. And that's one thing, I've been so busy making it. I, the one thing I actually hadn't done is like, waited, worked out if somebody asked me that question, what was I going to do next with it? And I still wasn't totally confident I could control developing it for a series without, 
I thought I didn't know enough if the studio producers and people like said, well, you, you have to do it like this and you can't do that, whether they were telling the truth and whether they're going to push me down a, a road that was what was familiar, familiar to them, but actually wasn't right for the project. So I needed to know a little bit more about the industry. So I, I noticed they had this on their, their books and I said, look, can I work on that and help develop it? And I can learn on that, learn about series a little bit more. So I directed the pilot for Little Princess um, and I'll show you a little clip of it so you get an idea. It's a few years old now. There was it crashed. <laughs> crashed it. Um, but yeah, it was a preschool series and it did really well for, um, as far as a preschool series can do, it, it sold, I think it's 160 territories around the world. Um, so it was one of those series that got translated into lots of different languages. Um, it made <coughs> no money via merchandise. We tried doing toys from it, but because she's um, barefooted, white smock, not the most attractive um, doll they considered, um, all the, with the kind of kids' feedback when you do like test screenings, they like, why she got no shoes on? I couldn't help it. It's how the book was drawn. And that's what Tony Ross, who was the illustrator, wanted. And he was, he's still alive and he has a lot of say in these things. So I couldn't change it. I couldn't give her like fancy trainers or anything like that. So um, she was successful on TV and kids did love watching it, but they would not buy the toys. So that's how studios make their money back. So even though it sold to all these 160 countries around the world, got repeats and all that kind of stuff, um, I allegedly have some profit share in it, and they, they've always said it's never made any money because <laughs> so, it never sold well in toys. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But um, so successful on screen doesn't always mean to say you're going to be su successful with making money from it. But I did get paid a wage to direct it, so it was a job. And I say so I learned a lot on it. Um, and it, we did a live stage show, which you get to go uh, on stage with your your fellow pepper pigs and things, it's all quite scary. Um, Rupert the bear and Fifi in the flower tot, so yeah, <laughs> very weird. And um, Brian Blessed was one of the characters who did voices, so that was some of our terrible merchandise, it looks like he's strangling it. Um, so it was fun to learn about that side of TV and how children's TV does rely so much on merchandise to recoup its costs, because it's a lot of upfront cost to produce a series, and one thing you probably don't know is that when you get something commissioned on TV, the channel only pays like, if you're lucky, tops 30% of the money towards the budget of your show. Um, so for Little Princess, I think it was maybe a bit less than that, but Dave's, but I think they realized it's gonna be a hard sell. So they gave 30% of the money. So ITV gave us 30% of the money. All the rest, you have to fund yourself. You have to find co-funders, whether that be networks abroad, or somebody maybe wants to do books, or somebody who wants to do toys. And so they will look at it and think, well, it doesn't exist as books already and it doesn't exist as toys already, so why would we put money in? So it's actually really hard to get the funding together uh, for a new TV show, unless you're picked up by somebody who completely funds everything, like Nickelodeon do and Cartoon Network. So they have lots of money and they will fund 100% their kids' cartoons, whether they're successful or not. So they don't have to rely on merchandise because um, they're rich. But if you, if you make shows for BBC, ITV, like kind of the British ones, they only give you like, say, up to 30% of the money, so you have to find the rest. So um, that's how it is. At this time, my dad had a stroke and he, he, he went into a wheelchair. And so I started to think about mobility and access and how movement um, can be really w good to work with in animation. Um, we had donkeys in my background and holidays in Spain. <laughs> Um, I'll go back to the big view in a minute, but um, I don't want it to crash. And they kept asking after Little Princess finished about uh, Anna Spud. And then eventually I said, yes, let's develop it now. I've learned enough. So we made Dave Spud. I changed it to Dave Spud because, um, again, doing my research as much as I could, I realized it would be advantageous if um, it was two kind of protagonists rather than just being Anna. So Anna's still there, but I really wanted to incorporate Anna and the wheelchair to show you some mobility uh, issues into the show. 
and also have Dave in it. So I made it a brother and sister and then brought in friends and the, the family and bring back some of the things that I really wanted in the student version of the film that for some reasons I was talked out of. Um, like I really wanted the mum to be voiced by a kind of a, a, a really burly trucker. And um, they're just like, why would you do that? And I was like, well, because I want it to be like that. I, I grew up on like people like Les Dawson and I, re I really see it as her character. She's a really strong, stoic character you do not say no to. And so um, I, the, the mum's now cast is played by Philip Glenister from Life of Mars. Like, he's the gruffest voice I could find on any of the showreels. Um, and then they got Jane Horrocks to play quite a lot of the characters, so she plays the grand because she's really versatile. Um, and Dave, he was the hardest to cast because he's supposed to be um, a bit of an underdog, very ordinary, no special talents, but at the same time, he's supposed to be a strong character and just pushes through and finds the solution, even if it's not one that it has always a great outcome, it gets a result that's okay. And the only person I could really think of having that kind of strong, stoic kind of quality, but at the same time being quite childlike, was at that time Johnny Vegas. So he plays um, Dave. Uh, and also wanted those kind of very obvious British accents, whether it be from Manchester or from being from Hull or from London. I don't really care what the region is, as long as it feels like it's drawn from a British kind of sensibility rather than being American all the time. Um, so I did a pilot. I'm going to keep it small on the screen if that's okay, because I'm worried it's going to crash if I go big again. So I should say what this is, is basically a selling tool to get the pitch to be commissioned by a TV network. You have to create a little trailer of your idea. You don't have much money to do it, you don't have much time to do it, but they want to see something moving because people generally don't have a great imagination for how the show will be unless they see something that kind of represents it. So we did this pilot. And again, <coughs> some bits of it work, some bits don't. Right. <laughs> so I did this pilot. I probably overthought it too much. And again, the voices, as you can tell, aren't the cast that I ended up with that I just listed earlier. So this was a cast that I used for the pilot. This is a bit too much to the producer and what cast he was thinking of. And so it didn't quite feel right. And also the, the style moved away from what I draw in my sketchbook. Things lost their black outlines and um, I don't know, sort of influenced by fashion trends of animation at the time. And it, when I was, by the time I'd finished it, I didn't like it that much, but we had to sell it as that. Uh, that was the problem. So I had this pilot that I didn't really like and, um, and pitch it. Luckily, it got picked up by the BBC based on the pilot and some scripts, and it was enough. And I thought, OK, then I'll go back when we come to do it properly and put things back to how they should be. Um, so it was picked up um, by the BBC. They, they commissioned us to do a couple of scripts. Um, again, they put in the money, 
um, to develop it a bit further, but the, the funding, the 30% was dependent on us raising the rest of the money. I didn't know that at the time, but that's what it was. Um, so I wrote the first full length script uh, for it, Starfish called Gareth. It took ages because the ABC just kept going backwards and forwards because they didn't really know what the show was and because we weren't that confident about what it was either. Kept changing things. Um, and then after about two years of uh, waiting for the series to get commissioned and get the green light, I heard via LinkedIn that BBC had dropped it and they dropped it like a year prior um, because we just didn't raise the money in time. So, um, so a lady at BBC said, oh, nobody tell you, we don't have the show anymore, we, we dropped it. I was like, all oh, right, oh, I've been waiting for two years, why didn't nobody tell me? And the studios kept, kept it quiet, they just didn't want to tell me because they just kept trying to raise money, they were just hoping. And they knew that if I, they told me, I'd go off and get a job somewhere else. So um, I was at that point broke, um, no money, because I hadn't worked for like two years, just waiting for things to happen. So I became a landscape gardener, <laughs> so I just like, stuff it, I'm leaving the industry, I've had enough. So I worked and bashed out gardens for a while with um, this company and I really enjoyed it. And actually um, what I did learn from that is you don't have to, if you, sometimes you can do a different, completely different industry and really enjoy it. And what I did really enjoy about that was um, it showed that I was employable doing other things, which I, when you do something very niche, you worry that you, you're useless to everybody else. So I did that for a while, but also learned that being a gardener doesn't pay that well. And actually I was a bit old for it. But did like it and I've stayed in touch with them ever since. While I was doing that, um, like five years later, ITV picked up Dave Spud again. Um, so we went to ITV and um, we were able to move forward with it again. Um, so it took a long time, things didn't, didn't happen quickly. And um, while I was with um, ITV, because I had lots of time to sort of sit on it, I was able to see it clearly all over again. And, work back on what the ingredients of the show should be. So we came up with a writer's guide um, of what should be in every script when working with writers, um, what the kind of the story arc is and what for the main character, what it is they get every episode, but you can do it in a different way. Um, that's quite important when you like writing 26 or 52 episodes of like a kid's cartoon you have to have like a, a Bible, a writer's guide, so a new writer can come in who doesn't know the show very well, take this guide and write an episode for it. So we kind of worked out that Dave, the lead character, every episode he has a diet, desire, um, or he desires to be somewhere and um, that the viewers can relate to, the audience can relate to, and then because they relate to that bit, his desire, his common thread aspect of it, I'm then allowed to show that, how he gets that as weirdly as I want. And that's the thing, that's Marmite with the show. I do make the show quite surreal. Um, I grew up with shows like um, Twin Peaks and things like that when I was a kid. And I'm not frightened to throw stuff at, on the screen that kids won't get, it'll go over their heads. Parents twi go on Twitter all the time saying, WTF, yeah, what is this show? I don't mind that as long as I get to a conclusion that the kids don't feel cheated, that you've kind of explained how everything got you there. And if like they go under the sea, how did they breathe? If they went into space, how did that work out? I don't mind that you got there via washing machine. I just want to make sure that it ties up that they, they got there with an explanation and that they can breathe in space because they've got a diving gear on or they've got a plant under a glass bowl or something. So I don't want to cheat the audience, but at the same time, I'm quite happy to throw them on some sort of weird curveball adventures. Um, not really time for it to go into it today, but when I do work with writers, um, there is like basic story arcs you can work with. It's like, it's, it's, this is stuff you find on Google, so I just Googled that image. But um, basically, you know, you got your set up and you just throw in everything into it once you've got your kind of clear defined set up and then you can play games towards the end where they don't just get from linear A to B, but you think they're gonna achieve what they want, but then you kind of hold them there and pull everything away from them, like pull the rug from under their feet. So everything seems to go into the sort of what they would call the black moment, where you think it's just not gonna work out. And then they have a rethink on how they're gonna solve this problem with a different approach. 
and do a bit of soul searching and then they try again and then the audience is rooting with them and then they get to their kind of conclusion. But it's not always what they originally set out for, but it still answers what they wanted at the end, but in a different way. And they, they learned something hopefully from it. So that's kind of the story arc on it. Um, we, have, um, we have to define what the key themes are. It's like all this kind of stuff. Like the, when you do a, ki a kid's show, you have to um, constantly counteract any criticism of the show. And you get loads because um, his the way he looks and the way his kind of demeanor is. People say he's grumpy. Why would somebody watch somebody, somebody who's negative? So I have to constantly counteract that by saying he's not negative. He just looks like that. And he's a very ordinary kid, but he's actually a very strong character and he will find solutions to push through it. And it's all about a family being unified. And it's not also about um, being moralistic and saying, well, here's a character that's uh, we're in a wheelchair and we're going to make a story about that and make it into a positive thing. We're just saying this family just happens to include an old lady, somebody in a wheelchair, Dave, who's with very limited abilities, mum that might be a man with a, a hairy chest, and dad, who's a bit of a skin flint. You know, he's like, he doesn't like spending money. And that just happens to be the family unit, and they just get on with that and just move forward. So it's not something you get typically when Fifi and the Flower Tots, which is all about you know, petals and being smiley and learning something. But I just don't want to do that as storytelling. Um, you... Um, more about the beat outline. I know this is not a talk about writing. Um, I wanted to give you a glimpse of um, the schedule. Um, if I go, can I make that bigger? Yeah. So it's, <laughs> I don't look at the schedule very often. It's a bit overwhelming. Um, that was our last season. We're on the season number three of the series now. And this is when we did 52 episodes in a row. Um, sort of back to back over two years. And um, as you can see, there's lots of things like you get your whatever the blue represents, I guess that's scripts, and then it goes to animatic, and then it gets um, added with sound with the voice records, and then they put that together and it's cut to length and it's sent to ITV and they approve it. And then it goes to the first blocking pass of the animators. But what you'll not see in any of that is any point where it stops. There's no gap in there for you to have a break. <laughs> so the last season, um, I was like, well, what happens if I fall ill or if I need to take a holiday or something like that? They hadn't factored that into the schedule. So you have to learn to read schedules to realize how it affects you because <laughs> I was not happy with that schedule by the time I was working it. But by that time, it was too late. Um, so yes, so that's the stages of animation. Uh, the next panel will show a bit um, closer up. So you've got um, the blue is script. So you have that many weeks to a script um, from the very initial concepts to the final delivered script. The way scripts work is um, the writers pitch three or four treatment ideas, ideas for an episode. And um, we pick one that we think is going to go forwards and hasn't been already done, because the writers don't always watch the show, so they don't know what's already happened. Then they um, write up a, a more expanded version of that. If ITV are happy with that as an idea, they get paid half their script money um, for that. And then they get the rest of the money when the, the, the full script's written and approved. So if it's never approved, they don't get the rest of the money, but they've always got the first half. Um, they always get their money because we make sure that the scripts get approved because we, we all chip in and write on it and do our best to get it approved. The scripts then go to animatic and storyboarding. So they go to storyboards, get drawn up. Um, you quickly learn how long a script should be for a 10 minute episode, like 20 pages is usually as much as you need for a, a 10 minute show. And then that gets drawn up into a storyboard that gets put to an animatic cut with the voices that we've recorded, record all the voices separately, um, wherever they're, they're living, so in different studios. And um, they send that assembly back to me. And it's my job then to make the decision about what to cut out if it's too long. Sometimes these episodes come out at 16 minutes and I've got to get to 10, because ITV have given us a 10 minute schedule slot and you're not allowed to go over it by a second even, you have to like fit it, so you have to, get your story to length and 
after we've done animatics and that's approved, then it can get divvied out to the animators who then animate the scenes. All our animators are based in Cardiff. We have um, one of our co-funders. We talked about how we raised our money. We did a deal with Wales that um, if we did a large, large part of the production in Wales, we'd get a chunk of money from them. And so all our animators are based in Cardiff or our storyboarding gets done in Cardiff. And um, we then have done a Welsh version um, for broadcast in Wales. So we are small, smaller audience, but there is a Welsh version uh, called Die Potch, I think, of the show. And they're a really lovely bunch and work really hard and try and meet up with them as often as I can. Um, I could show you an animatic, but I'm aware that my time's going to run out, so I won't. And my daily life, like when I'm not here giving a talk, so I'll go back to this, is mostly just giving notes back, uh, feedback. So I have two monitors, and on one screen I have emails open, and then this thing called Slack, which is like a live feed of people can send images, so whether it be from the design department or the editing department or the layout department, they all can see that I'm online live. And at any point they can contact me because I'm a director supposedly and ask me a question or send me an image and there and then I can answer it or draw over it. Or, and so they get live feedback. That's why I can work from home in Slangoflin and not in a studio in London because I'm able to do this in real time with them. So it's been amazing really. So I have that going um, and you have to just be disciplined every time. So I log on for that at nine o'clock and then you do your working hours and you log off at five, say goodbye, and then they won't contact you anymore. Well, that's the idea. <laughs> um, so that's really helped working freelance and working from home that you can do that. I can be sent um, via F-Track um, the animation as it's coming in, and I can check the backgrounds and check the character scale and how the animation's looking, whether it's on twos or on ones. So I can watch that and feed that back. But it's just a lot of my time is just filling in little boxes of text saying that that's fine, or can you put that onto ones because it looks a bit jerky, or something's broken about it, or don't use that prop because it looks too much like a penis or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, which you'd be surprised by. Animators get bored and they try and sneak things all the time into a show. And I'm like, it's a kid's show. You're going to get me in a lot of trouble. And ITV right now are constantly coming back with, well, that sounds like you've done an F-bomb there. And that sounds like a swear word there. And I'm like, no, it's Johnny Vegas. He's got bad teeth. And he sometimes just slurs his words. But it does make it sound like he's swearing a lot. But so you get people complaining about that and putting that on Twitter and TikTok. That make it look like you're putting swearing into the show, which we're not. But we did get in trouble for using some Cockney rhyming slang. Uh, the first trailer that went out, um, Gran calls Dave, so her grandson, I guess, um, uh, a, a Burke. And um, I thought that was OK as a trailer for the show. But it turns out Burke is Cockney rhyming slang for Berkeley Hunt, which is, <laughs> yeah. So Gran called his uh, grandson. So that was um, the first trailer on kids TV. So you can imagine ITV got a lot of complaints about that. They said that was the most complaints they've had for a show that's not been aired yet. And um, I was like, yes. <laughs> it's like, but we didn't do it on purpose. It's such a random thing. But people have nothing better to do than to watch a show and then write in and complain if they think it offends. Um, the sound effects of like footsteps and slurping tea and all that kind of stuff. Well, fun world of live action, but done in Foley. Can't really see it because it's a bit bright in here, but um, we work for a company uh, called Phonic who do all our sound mixing and they do all the live Foley. And it's such a beautiful uh, craft in itself, just creating all the sounds. They keep all this junk and then they watch the picture and then create all the, the noises for the picture. And it's really nice. It really does lift the story. Like, there's a few stages, like when I first see the animation come back, I'm excited by the story again, because by the time you've read the story a thousand times, you're bored by it. But when I see the animation come back, it's nice. And also when it gets sound put on it, it's really nice. So that's um, where it gets sound mixed. And their they're basements are beneath a, a farm, believe it or not. Um, so the Welsh version, Dai Poch. 
Um, don't know why they didn't call it Dave Spud, because I didn't realize that names would change into Welsh, but they, they, they changed it to that. Um, and I don't know what language that is. <laughs> oh, maybe Russian. Oh, we did a Russian. Swedish, that's Swedish. There you go, Swedish version. <laughs> that one? Russian. Yeah, did a Russian version. Um, don't do merchandise, but somebody knitted that and put it on eBay. <laughs> we do do books. Um, so that's kind of it. Um, the one thing that was unusual about the show that, again, because I'd learnt what you what I can stand my ground on is that I didn't want to work with a composer that was we got for Little Princess. The producers were already contacting them and saying, would you be interested in doing this show? Because they knew them, they often work with people they've already familiar with and feel comfortable with. And that put me in a panic. I was on holiday and I could tell that they were going to sign up this composer. And um, so I quickly went on Instagram and contacted a few bands that I liked that I thought might be Big at one time, but now less busy, but also might have kids and might be interested in doing music for a, a kid's show if they thought they were allowed to do what they wanted. So I reached out to a few bands of my sort of generation, which was like Basement Jacks, Stereo Lab. Um, I think I was even thinking like St. Tatiana at that time, but um, uh, Stereo Lab came back. They'd already broken up, um, so it was just one guy. When I looked at his, his music, it was really just dark stuff so I was like no but Basement Jacks came back and they were, um, they, they were interested and when I explained that they could provide all the music up front um, they wouldn't need to work to picture at all I'd work out what I needed they would just have to give me like lots of music and I'd cut it myself and um, mix it in they were up for it so I work with Basement Jacks and they do all the music for the show now and they're great because it works around there because they make all their money now from touring uh, around festivals and beef and places and DJing. So even though they're not in the charts anymore, they they do all that kind of stuff. So and they've been really good and creative to work with. And I'm, that's one decision I'm really happy with. But it was a gamble a bit because <coughs> you don't get a chance to try it and then say no. Um, one thing I found that's frustrating, there's a few other bands since the show's come out that like it and get in touch and say, we'd love to do some music for it. But because our studio never worked with licensing contracts where you license just a piece of music they've always worked with um, controlling all the rights where everything about that piece of music is owned by the studio um, the bands won't sign that they won't sign those kind of contracts they'll only agree that you can use that piece of music on your show and they keep all the rights uh, that's not a problem to me but our studio just somehow don't understand that and won't work with it. So I can't get other people's music into the show at the moment, but so that's frustrating. But so you don't get everything you want. <laughs> and that's it. So if you've got any questions, that's how I've got to the show. And we're currently working on series three now. And I know CITV as of last week is going to desist. It's like ITV have just announced they're not doing children's programming live on TV anymore. Um, they might do a bit of preschool at the weekend, but six to 12 year olds are no longer going to be on TV live. They're just going to do all streaming. So that's the way it seems to be going with children's content, that majority of kids access stuff via streaming. But for me, I'm sad about that because you always had streaming as well. And there was something about being on TV because actually your mom or people that you didn't make the show for might just catch it by accident and enjoy it. And families can sit down and watch it together. And that won't happen, I don't think, if it's on a dedicated kid slot on a streaming device. I don't think you'll get a 30 some old like, well, they might, but choosing to log into a, a kid's, like, cartoon section of a, a streaming device. So that's a shame. So things are changing. And also, there was a bit of um, competition by being on TV. You got, there was a, a, a bun fight to get that slot. Because, um, so you had to sort of earn your worth to be on it. Where if you're on streaming, they can put any old content on it, I suppose. So I don't know if that will mean they won't commission as much new stuff. I don't know. I guess I'll find out, but that's only say happened last week. And when they commissioned the show, they didn't tell us that was going to happen. So um, it's all a bit of a learning curve, but we're just carrying on as normal. And I don't know if that will mean that things change. If 
for how long the, the episodes can be, because we say we always work to a dedicated time slot that we're allowed on TV. But if it's on streaming device, I don't know if that's important anymore, so maybe I can do a longer show. Um, guess, guess don't know. So it's always changing landscapes. You have to keep adapting.